slide up on sponges. Um, somebody remind us what is so unique about sponges when compared to other animals? How are sponges unique when compared to other animals? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, so they don't have any specialized tissues, right? They have these cells called panacocytes that form an outer covering, but it's not a specialized tissue and where you have several different cell types all contributing to a single function. Good. How else are they different from the rest of the animals? Yeah. They're invertebrates. They are, I, although they certainly are invertebrates. There are a number of animals that are uh, as well. They completely lack germ layers, right? So they have no germ layers. There are other animals with two germ layers, and then there are other animals with three germ layers. But sponges are the only animals that have no germ layers. Okay? Any other things about sponges that make them unique? Yeah. And then regrow? Yeah. And... That's super awesome, but luckily for us, there are other animals that can do that as well, because we'll get to talk about that quite often, actually. It's, it's kind of fun, especially if the animal is like grazing on your farm. You see this a lot with sea stars and oyster farms. Sea stars, as long as a portion of the central disc is in place, it will grow a, the rest of the missing body. So if you cut a sea star in half and throw it back into the ocean, now instead of one sea star eating your oysters, you have two sea stars eating your oysters. It's awesome. It's awesome. So they also lack symmetry. They have no symmetry, right? We have animals that are uh, radially symmetrical, and we have animals that are bilaterally symmetrical. Sponges are the only animals that have no symmetry, okay? These are important things to keep in mind to be able to use to talk about sponges, all right? And so uh, this is where we left off, and uh, we'll basically mention uh, that sponges are filter feeders, and it's one of the things that makes sponges a nice addition to any marine fish tank is that they move through enormous amounts of water, pulling material out of that water to feed on, okay? And so all of these cell types function overall in the entire sponge body to pull water in and pump water back out, but while water's inside, to absorb nutrients and other materials out of it, okay? So water enters a sponge through uh, holes that are called ostea. What a singular would be osteum. They go into some uh, cavity in most sponges, and then they leave the sponge through what's called the osculum, or if they have several exits, oscula. And so here's a diagram from the text just showing a typical sponge um, body. And so the, here you can see these large openings. These are oscula in which water is being pumped out of the sponge. And the ostia are too small for you to see where water is being drawn into uh, the sponge. So here is a typical sponge body plan. Those of you that have lab yesterday, you probably sketched something very similar to this. Those of you that have lab tomorrow, Surprise, uh, you will sketch something very similar to this. And this is a very simple sponge body plan. Here is an osteum, plural would be ostea, water drawn into the central cavity and then pumped out uh, through the osculum. All right? And again, sponges, they are filter feeders and they are really, really good at it. Really good at it. And if you only have one sponge in your tank and you want two sponges, you can pull a piece off and it will grow a second sponge. You know what's really cool is the cells will actually re-aggregate too. So if you take a sponge and you shove it through cheesecloth, which will rip it into a whole bunch of tiny pieces, and then you leave it in there, those cells will re-aggregate together and, and form the sponge. And what's really cool is if you take two different sponge individuals and you run them both through the cheesecloth, they'll re-aggregate back into the two individuals. Now you go, oh, that's really awesome. For an organism that doesn't have complex tissues, how does that level of cellular communication actually happen? It's a wonderful question. We don't really know, but it's awesome. Plus then you can take a red sponge and a blue sponge and you can run them through a cheesecloth and put them in water and now you've got something purple, but then over time we'll separate back into red and blue. 
It's kind of fun. You can have this little thing sitting on your desk, so beautiful, and everybody will love it. All right. So our next framing question, going outside of sponges and now finally starting to talk about some animals that have germ layers and have symmetry. How are Nidarians unique from other non-bilaterians? So this question gives you an idea that Nidarians are non-bilaterians, right? Because how are they unique from other non-bilaterians? An indication that they are non Bilaterians. What on earth does that mean? What is a bilaterian? Somebody tell us. Yeah, Levi. Yeah, so it's an animal with bilateral symmetry. True or false? We are bilaterians. That is true, right? And so how are Nidarians unique from other non-bilaterians? Well, we know if they're bilaterians, uh, they are going to be radially symmetrical and they're going to have two germ layers. Okay, that goes along with being non-bilaterian, unless you're a sponge, of course, then you have no germ layers and you have no symmetry. But if you're not bilaterally symmetrical and you're not a sponge, you are radially symmetrical and you have two germ layers. What are those two germ layers? Anyone remember? I'll give you a hint. They're the technical names for outer layer and inner layer. Ectoderm and endoderm. Look at that. Critical thinking at its finest. Nicely done. Nicely done. And I have no idea why this point came before the one right after it, but alas, that's what happened. Um, so this phylum, Nideria, is named uh, for the presence of a very specific cell type called a nidocyte. With inside of those cells, basically the cell is very little more than just this organelle called a nematocyst. And those of you that had lab yesterday, you drew this, hopefully, because you were supposed to sketch this. Those of you that have lab tomorrow, you will sketch this. And these, these cells are wonderful. These organisms, somewhat like sponges, do not have complex nervous systems. Okay? And yet they have these cells that can fire when triggered. And so these cells, these nidocytes and the nematocysts inside of them, tend to be triggered individually and usually are triggered by a touch stimulus. So that if you brush up against a nidarian, like a jellyfish or a anemone or a hydra, that they are just gonna fire spontaneously. The organism doesn't have to choose to fire those and then can replace them with other cells. Yeah, Cameron. Well, so the size of the nematocyst and the, the number of nematocysts and the presence or absence of a toxin has a, all of those have a large impact on whether or not you feel pain. So not all anemones have? Not all anemones have nematocysts that can penetrate our skin. And even those that do, sometimes there's no pain associated because the size of the nematocyst is particularly small. But I don't know if you've ever touched an anemone and it didn't hurt, but then you were stuck to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it stung you. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't accompanied by any pain. Yeah. And then sometimes you rip tentacles off as you pull your finger away. It's sad, but they'll regrow them. <laughs> yeah. And really, it's their fault. Although they didn't choose to sting you, it just happens. But if these cells are triggered independently of the animal choosing to trigger them, what does that actually make possible? The animal doesn't have to choose to fire them. Which means if you took nidocytes from a nidarian, you could fire them without you having to think about it, right? And so there are some animals that eat nidarians and they do not digest the nidocytes. And instead they deposit the nidocytes, these cells that they got from the nidarian, into their own tissues. And now they have stinging cells that will protect them from predation. Although those stinging cells didn't protect the nidarian that they ate from predation, so the efficacy of it is <laughs> in question. But it's kind of cool. So you could theoretically cover yourself with a bunch of these nidocytes, and you could make yourself a stinging nidarian of sorts. Sorry, I thought it was cool. <laughs> All right, the radial symmetry of these. Uh, Nidarians is, is, is very clearly 
uh, displayed throughout the entire life cycle. That is uh, somewhat unique. Uh, some of our other non bilaterians they are radially symmetrical in some life stages and bilaterally symmetrical in others. Okay, this, you've got the radial symmetry, and here's what you might think of as a complete Nidarian life cycle. Not all Nidarians have all these steps, but this you might think of as a complete Nidarian life cycle. It begins with the polyp, and again, those of you that have lab yesterday, these are like the hydra that you looked at in lab. The one on this pre prepared slide probably gave you less trouble than the one uh, that was living. But anyways, that's, that's what happens. Okay, so we've got a polyp stage. It's attached mouth away from the substrate. And then you've got the medusa stage, which is basically an upside down polyp, shortened this way and mouth faces down. Okay, a, a jelly is a very clear picture of what a medusa looks like. All right, so the two germ layers, one forms an outer covering. This would be the ectoderm, forms an outer covering known as an epidermis, and the inner gastrodermis, and then these two are separated by this non-living mesoglia that's gelatinous, which is why we call these jellyfish, which is a misnomer because they are not fish, right? <laughs> Probably better to call them sea jellies, but they've got that jelly-like structure. Have you ever held a jelly? It's, it's, it's really interesting. It feels like a bag of jello. Like if you were to stick jello in a Ziploc bag and just move it around in your hand, it feels very similar to holding a jelly and moving it around in your hand. Okay, we have a bunch of jellies in lab. If you want to experience that, you're more than welcome to. You just have to wear safety glasses because they're preserved. All right. So these cells, these nidocytes packed full of nematocysts, uh, tend to be found throughout uh, the gastrodermis, all over the tentacles, oftentimes carrying toxins that immobilize prey, but not always. And again, we've already mentioned this, they fire when touched. Okay, The organism does not have to think to fire them, which is good because the organism does not have a sophisticated nervous system, and it is incapable of thinking. All right. It's lecture break time. So in a previous lecture break, we asked the question, why uh, are so many animals bilaterally symmetrical and UC lamate? Do you remember that question? How did we answer it? Anyone remember how we answered that? Is it bi yeah, you basically have two choices. Either it's because they all descend from an ancestor that was bilaterally symmetrical and a UC lamate, or because it is biomechanically necessary in order to live an active and efficient lifestyle. Okay? Do you remember that? If you don't, you better figure out some way to remember that. Okay? It's a good thing to be able to actually talk about. And remember, that's from 27. That's not from 28. That's on this exam. So you've got, I don't know, somewhat less than 48 hours to remember that. Or, or not. I mean, it's up to you. All right, so what I want you to do is this. I want you to take a couple of minutes, then kind of thinking along those lines, answer this question. Why don't Nidarians have to be bilaterally symmetrical and UC lamates? Okay, they are radially symmetrical, and they can't be a UC lamate because you can only be a UC lamate if you have three germ layers. And they only have two, right? Right? They only have two, Okay. So think through this question, talk through this question with those around you, and come up with a list of reasons, not one reason, but a list of reasons in which they uh, are not um, bilaterally symmetrical and why they are not UC limits. All right? Two minutes, starting now.
not really effective on interracial violence. This helps them cover a lot of That's why they don't have to be like a All right, so somebody explain this to me. Why aren't Nidereans bilaterally symmetrical and eucelimates? Joe, what do you got for us? Right, well, why don't they need to be? So, yeah, Carlos. Yeah, so have you heard the term plankton before? Plankton is a reference to anything that just floats passively in the water column. And so most plankton are really small, right? So you've got phytoplankton like dinoflagellates, diatoms, cyanobacteria that, that harvest sunlight and use that to build organic material. And then you have zooplankton that are animals that float passively in the... Uh, water column and typically eat phytoplankton and jellies are one of those types of organisms they are zooplankton now they're massive most zooplankton are tiny still microscopic are like microscopic crustaceans the larval stages of some other animals but jellies some of these things are enormous but they're still plankton they float passively in the water column so they don't need to be bilaterally symmetrical because they don't have directed movement. They just float passively in the water column. Now, if they contract the bell, they will move up. And if they relax the bell, they will move down in the water column. But they don't really care too much about lateral movement. They just move with the current, which is nice because then it becomes predictable on when you're, where you're going to find these jellies. So then you know when you should be swimming out in open water. Or if you are an animal that feeds on jellies, it's very predictable of where to find them. Have any of you ever eaten a sea jelly? Yeah, me too. It's, it's different. It's a different kind of experience. You'd think it'd be like nice and really soft and like you bite into it and it's like, oh, it's like a jelly-filled donut, right? I, I got that. I'm, I'm all about that. But that layer outside of the jelly, it is, a, it is a different kind of structure. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like overcooked pasta that's still undercooked. It's like, it's, it's crunchy, but it's mushy. I don't, I don't, it's just, it's just strange. Yeah. Where? Uh, my, it, yeah, I mean, I, my sister-in-law is, is Chinese. And whenever we get together with her, she tries to figure out what I will eat. <laughs> it's like a game. It's a game that we play. And so far I'm winning because she hasn't found anything that I wouldn't eat. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, I'm, if you eat something, you, you got to eat the whole thing, right? Otherwise, you didn't eat it. You sampled it, right? Micah. Are you saying when we were eating since they're non-atmospheric? Uh-huh. Um, one reason could be since they're passively floating through water, they need a protective structure. So since, I don't know, are they circular? So they, they are. So they can interact with their environment in 360 degrees, right? Radially symmetrical organisms. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So if you are not going to actively move away from predators, your, your, your uh, defense mechanisms need to be a little bit different, right? It's more akin to like a plant, right? If you are not going to – plants – I don't know if you knew this or not, but plants do not actively run away from grazing <laughs> organisms. I know it's surprising, right? It's a shocker. You didn't know you were going to learn something about plants today in organismic biology. You're welcome. Um, and so plant defense mechanisms are a little bit different, right? 
And that's what we see with Nigerians. Their defense mechanisms are a little bit different because they're not going to actively run away from predators. They're going to sit around and hope that their nidocytes are good enough. Yeah. And, and being radially symmetrical allows them to, like you said, pack a lot more of those nidocytes into a particular area. Good. What about the whole eucelomate portion? This one's a little bit more interesting. You're like, okay, I understand why they don't need to be bilaterally symmetrical because they're not moving with any intentionality. But what about a eucelomate body plan? We talked about that, 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 that increases efficiency in design. What's the relationship between efficiency and rapid movement? Well, so here, if, if you're going to move rapidly, you need a lot of energy to do that, right? Many times in this class so far, we've talked about what's called the principle of allocation. Somebody remind me what that means. My brain's not working well today. I need, I need, I need some help. Levi. Yeah, you only have a given amount of energy to invest in all of the activities of life. And if one of those activities is rapid movement, you better believe you're investing an enormous amount of energy in that. Right? If you, don't, if you don't believe that, give a five-year-old a Snickers bar and see what happens, right? It's like you can see all of that energy. Their body is used to, hey, you have excess energy. We're going to use that for just, just chaos, right? It's not so fun. But you got to give them like a full-size Snickers bar. You don't give them like one of the, the fun size. Not a king size because that's, that's irresponsible. That might be child abuse. But you give them, you know, a full-size Snickers bar and just sit back and watch what happens. It's spectacular. It is spectacular. But, yeah, I mean, if you're not going to move rapidly, you don't have to be as efficient, right? You can be more wasteful, and it's okay. Because, really, what are you investing in as a jelly? If you are a jelly, a sea jelly, I was going to say jellyfish, but I don't like that. So you are a sea jelly. What aspects of life are you investing in? What are the characteristics of life? Reproduction, metabolism, responding to stimuli, growing and developing, right? Growing and developing, yeah, a lot of that happens, but not as much as what you find in other organisms. Responding to stimuli, certainly not as much of that as you find in other organisms. They're not actively moving. They don't invest as much in that. Bless you. So it's like reproduction and metabolism. And again, if you are not as concerned with being efficient, you're not investing a lot of energy in metabolism either. You'll eat more than you need, right? And it's okay. And so really, your, your one investment is reproductive output. And sure, if you are a lot more efficient, you can maybe put out more offspring than you would be if you were less efficient. But you'll put out plenty just as well. Just as well. All right? It's fun to be in a place where jellies are spawning. I mean, by fun, I mean, it's really weird. Like, you can almost walk out on the surface of the ocean. It's so densely, uh, what, what, what's the term I'm looking for? It's so densely packed with jelly gametes. It's, it's impressive. And jelly bodies, right? You can almost walk on these, on these jellies. It's fun. And by fun, I mean weird. All right? Any other questions on that? Does it make sense? You could also answer it that they did not descend from a bilaterally symmetrical and a UC Lamade ancestor. And really, you can answer that even if you don't think all animals root back to a single ancestor. You could say modern jellies descended from an ancestor that was structured like they were, right? That was radially symmetrical and diploblastic. I mean, it's only got two germ layers. It can't be a UC Lamade. Because what makes it a UC Lamade versus a pseudo -C -Lamate? It's not the presence of the cavity, but it's the nature of the cavity. What does a eucelomate cavity look like? Mesoderm on both sides, inside and out. The mesoderm is that third germ layer. If you don't have a third germ layer, you're not wrapping a cavity with that third germ layer. Does that make sense? You can't wrap something in something you don't have. That was, that was a confusing way to say that. Yeah, you're welcome for that. All right, so here's a representation of these uh, nidocytes. And again, these nidocytes, almost the entire cell is devoted to this nematocyst, this organelle in there that is a stinging structure. 
tends to have a bar a thread wrapped around this central structure with a barb and so when this gets triggered water rushes in to the cell and as it does it forces this out and basically throws the thread uh, outward and then if that thread's got a barb on it uh, it'll stick into whatever it 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 um, penetrates and then so now not only did you use this to subdue your prey but you can pull it back in and reel it in it's fantastic it's like uh what what is uh, spear not spear fishing with when you shoot it with an arrow the, with a is it spear fishing oh yeah just shoot it with a bow bow fishing bow fishing and you've got a rope attached to the other end it's just wonderful right yeah micah Isn't this the size of a cell, though? yes but if you've got millions of these hitting the same object at the same time it's okay and and you can pack quite a bit of toxin into a single cell yeah Yeah, it was sea cucumbers eviscerate themselves. So when, when afraid, they basically eject everything inside of the body outward. And so um, it really, it's, it's almost like a, cloud, a smoke cloud, right? Like you throw a little smoke bomb and then you disappear. That's what the sea cucumbers do. Like they just eviscerate themselves and then they move away. Yeah, and then it wraps around a food item, and then they use it to feed on. Sure, and so it's just a modification of what the sea cucumbers have a design to do. Yeah, and so again, here's the polyp and the medusa. Medusa, an upside down polyp, a little bit shortened this way. Mouth faces down. Polyp, mouth faces up. There's more to this story than just like, oh, that's cool. Like we've got a polyp and a medusa. We can use this to classify Nigerians into different groups. There are Nigerian groups that only have a polyp and no medusa stage. And so we organize them based on that. Uh, anemones are that way. Coral are that way. And they're grouped together in a group called Anthozoa. That, the name is bonus, but using this to classify them is not bonus. Okay, that's something you should be able to know. So if you were asked, I don't know, hypothetically, how would, how, what tools would you use to classify Nigerians? You should be comfortable saying the presence or absence of certain life stages. Okay. And then you have some jellies that there is no polyp stage, or if there is, nobody's ever found it. Okay. Basically it's just, uh, looks like it's just the Medusa stage. And then there's a group that has both and very obviously. Those of you that had lab yesterday, you had a slide from Obelia, which is a colonial Nigerian, and it's got very characteristic polyp and medusa stage, right? Almost textbook, which is why you see that one in lab. All right. Any questions about Nigerians? I What's that? The C? Oh, why is it? I don't know. Yeah, why can't it just be an N? Well, and then you have another group of non bilaterians called Tenophora, and it's CT. Yeah, I don't know. So what is a mollusk? What is a mollusk? What is a mollusk? Give me an example of a mollusk. A scallop, I'll take it. An oyster, I'll take it. Mussels, clams. Everybody's going bivalves. This is awesome. That's only one group of mollusks. Snails. So now we've got a gastropod. We've got another group of mollusks. Shrimp or crustaceans. Uh, chambered nautilus. A chambered nautilus. So the squid, nautilus, octopi, or cephalopods. And so we've got an enormous amount of diversity packed into this group. So what is a mollusk? The answer to that question is, it's, it's hard to say. It's, it's hard to say. But anyways, we'll get there. So we talked about that genetic tools split protostomes into two groups. And what were those two groups? One of them is up on the board, Lophotrochozoa, not Lophotrochozoan. That's an organism in Lophotrochozoa. And what's the other group? Ectozoa. Okay, ectozoa. So remember that we, we talked about this before. Both of those groups, ectozoa and lophotrochozoa, have a polytomy. Why is that an issue? What's the issue with a polytomy? Yeah, Levi. 
Yeah, it's an indication that we don't know how you could trace these groups back to a single uh, ancestor. And so there's a major polytomy in Lophotrochozoa where mollusks are. So mollusca is just one phylum in this group. Uh, and this group is a mess. And mollusca, this, this phylum, is also a mess. Phylum contains about 75,000 living species and about 90 to 100,000 fossil species. Okay? It's a pretty speciose group. Great deal of diversity. And so now we have to start thinking, okay, well, what characteristics do all mollusks have? Right? If you think about a snail and a squid, what characteristics do those two organisms share? It tastes fairly similar, actually. I don't know if you've ever eaten mm -hmm. snail or if you've eaten squid, but they do taste fairly similar. And that's because of one shared feature. So all mollusks, all mollusks have what we call a muscular foot, unless they don't. Although the, those that don't, they, it's very obvious that they've reduced their body down significantly. Okay, so they have a muscular foot. They have a structure on their body where they concentrate a lot of their muscle tissue. And it works in locomotion, which is why we call it a foot. They have a visceral mass, so they pack all of their organs into a small space. And you can think about this. This is obvious with like a snail, right? Where the snail, you know, it's got that big muscular foot and head that come out of the shell. And then all of their organs are packed up into the shell. And you're like, yeah, they'll pack their entire body in there sometimes. It's true. Uh, but the, the organs actually take up a small amount of space. And so visceral mass uh, is kind of the norm uh, for mollusks is to pack their uh, organs into a small place. And then the last one is the mantle. And this is, one of, this is what makes snails taste a little like squid. And it's, they've got this outer layer called the mantle that is built very similar, whether you're talking about a snail or a squid or a clam or a mussel. Bivalves are a little bit different, though, because they're filter feeders, so they taste like whatever they eat, right? It's the reason why catfish taste like garbage is because the, when, when you have something that, uh, that either is a, uh, a filter feeder or is like a, a bottom feeder, it tastes like whatever it eats, right? And so you, it's like sometimes the catfish tastes awesome. Other times it just tastes a little muddy because they taste like what they eat. Same thing with clams. It's like, why does clam chowder taste so different sometimes? It's because the clams taste like what they eat. Anyways, this is another story for another time. So there are seven classes within this phylum. And three of those classes are especially speciose. And those are what you all gave me. So there was bivalves, right? Scallops, clams, uh, mussels. Is that it? Is that what everybody said? I feel like I'm missing one. Uh, and then there's gastropods, which are snails and slugs. And then there's cephalopods, which are octopi, squid, nautilus, cuttlefish. Most mollusks are dioecious. Have we seen this term before? I think so. So die means what? Two. Ecious means house or houses. So this literally means two houses. And the idea here is that the male and the female are in separate houses. Okay, sexes are separate in mollusks. So most mollusks are dioecious. This would be opposed to what? What's the root for one? Mono. mono. So monoecious means one house. Male and female live in the same house. Okay, and so you have an organism that is both male and female, or hermaphroditic is another term. Most mollusks have an open circulatory system. And we'll see this again. We'll actually see this a lot in animals. Uh, an open circulatory system where blood is just pumped into a big cavity that surrounds the organs. Cephalopods, though, are some of the most uh, complex uh, mollusks and the complex of all organisms on Earth. They do not have an open circulatory system. They have a closed circulatory system. And if you've seen Finding Dory, you already know this, but they have three hearts. 
they have a central heart and then they have two hearts for or one heart for each guild three hearts and so they have very rapid very efficient circulation which allows them to move very rapidly and keep all of their tissues new fed i was going to say nutriated but that didn't sound right because i don't think it is and uh, they can keep all their tissues fed and oxygenated that one is that one is legit all right any questions about mollus so you see that if you were asked this question yeah allison You know, it's, I mean, they are escape artists for sure. Um, Y'all, you, you, you if you've never seen a video of this, you should watch it. Where you could put an octopus in a jar, seal the jar, and it will open the lid from inside and get out. And so, like, when you try to keep octopi in an aquarium, you, you are constantly making their exhibit more complicated because they learn how to get out. They can do... Uh, they can do mazes better than probably any mammal. There are some octopi that can perform better in a maze than any mammal other than a human. And so, and they have incredible memories. And so, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of most of the ways we assess a, a intelligence, that they are incredibly intelligent animals. And then they can, they can camouflage with their environment. They don't just change their color. They also change their texture. So, like, if they sit on a rock, they will take on the color and the texture of that rock. It's just, it's, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Any other questions about mollusks? So, you should be getting a sense that if you were asked this question, what is a mollusk, that it would be a very challenging question to answer. And so, you might write something like, I don't know, but here are some mollusks, right? That'd be kind of fun. I don't know what a mollusk is, but here are some examples of a mollusk. So here's a figure that's not from our text, but it represents the phylogeny of, of mollusks with the seven classes. And there's something in this phylogeny that is worth noting. And what is it? There are, there are no dotted lines, right, which is an indication that we have actually some reasonable confidence that that's true. Do you see the polytomy, yeah. right? Where we have one branch splitting into three, which is an indication that there's something messy here. There's something messy here. We don't exactly know what's going on. But notice our three most species groups, cephalopods, gastropods, and bivalves, are all from a single branch. And then over here, we've got your chitons and some A. placophora. Here's a typical gastropod uh, body plan. Here you have the muscular foot. Here you have the head. And so another typical feature of mollusks, but it's not true of all of them, that the head seems to be grouped along with the foot. Here you have your visceral mass, your organs packed into uh, a small space, and then you've got your mantle, your outer covering, uh, covering the organism. Here's a chitin. Polyplacophora, here's some mussels, some examples of bivalves. Here's some more gastropods, slugs and snails. Slugs aren't homeless. They don't make a shell, right? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't lose it. Yeah. Why do slugs dissolve when you put salt on them? <laughs> <laughs> um, most animals without some kind of non-living outer material would do the same. So we don't because we've got an enormous amount of protein built into our outer covering called keratin that resists the movement of water. Um, and then, you know, like an insect doesn't because it's got this outer cuticle. But most organisms that don't have that, if you put salt on it, water is going to rush to on the outside to dissolve that salt. And as it does, it just tears the, the body of the organism apart. Yeah. So then you get a, just an overall sense of... of something turning into a puddle. Yeah. Leeches do the same and a lot of soft-bodied organisms. Oh, on that previous diagram, the, uh, the cord was surrounding the mouth. Uh-huh. Why is that? It's weird. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And that's not necessarily, you know, indicative of, of all, 
you know, gastropods. But, uh, I mean, you just have a, a, a ring of nerves there. Usually when you see a nerve ring, you have the ability to move signals in all directions and not just linearly. And so a ring is, is typically um, used in areas where there's some benefit to being able to do that, where signals can move dispersely. And so, yeah, it's a good question. All right, a couple of last pictures. So this is right out of your text. This is what's called a cone snail, and their venom is some of the most toxic material on Earth. Um, so much so that the... Do you know how they measure the toxicity of venom? They measure the toxicity of venom using what's called the LD50, which stands for lethal dose necessary to kill 50% of mice injected with it. And so it's summarized as LD50. And so, um, which is kind of fun, I mean, to be the person, like the researcher checking the LD50 of a toxin. Um, unless, of course, you don't like killing mice and then it's not fun at all. Um, but this, the, these toxins have some of the smallest LD50s of any material on Earth. I mean, it's just impressive in their ability to uh, shut down n nervous function. And so... Um, works out really well for a snail. Snails are not known for rapid movement. And so if you're going to be a predatory snail, you better be able to subdue your prey really quickly. And that's why they have such a toxic venom. Um, but there are a lot of researchers using this uh, as um, like a, a, a way to regulate overreactions of, of nervous function. So anyways, sorry. Put that out there. Uh, so here's a representation of Cephalopoda. Uh, here's the Nautilus up in the left. There are a lot of extinct forms that are similar to this, but there's only one living uh, mollusk that has this weird gas-filled shell. The entire animal is basically here, and the rest of the shell is filled with gases that they use for maintaining buoyancy. Here we have a cuttlefish, similar to a squid, although the tentacles tend to be shorter and they tend to swim uh, parallel with the ground rather than perpendicular to the ground. Although here's a squid swimming uh, hmm. parallel with the ground instead of perpendicular. And then here's the blue ring octopus, another mollusk that is one of the most poisonous uh, animals on Earth. And it's really tiny, like would easily fit into the palm of your hand. And then one last picture. So this is one family, uh, Dentalidae. Uh, but these are scaphopods. Uh, these are scaphopods, scaphopoda, and uh, they're just weird. They're weird mollusks. We call these tusk shells because their shells look like an elephant tusk or, or a rhinoceros tusk. Uh, and a, they just have a extremely simplified body plan. And that's where we say, like, all mollusks have a foot except for those that don't. And these don't, but they, it's very obvious that they have a very reduced body plan that they probably were not always that way, but have lost uh, features and really simplified their body, body plan. Do you would predict at this point probably to feeding strategy, right? With simple feeding strategies come simple body plans. Like what? What are great examples of that trend? Parasites, right? Giardia, right? You've got a whole group of eukaryotes that have a significantly reduced mitochondrion, okay? Simplified feeding strategy accompanied or facilitates a very simple body plan. No parasite exemplifies that better than what? I mentioned this already. The tapeworm. Yeah. And a tapeworm is just a bag of reproductive organs. Okay. No digestive system, no nervous system, no excretory system. It's just a reproductive system and an outer covering. Oh, they do have some muscles because individual proglottids, piece of that, can break off and crawl their way various places, like out of the host or out of the toilet or, you know, whatever. That's yeah, fun. It's fun stuff. So parasites exemplify that really well. And then another feeding strategy that facilitates that, we also talked about this when we talked about fungi, uh, is decomposers, Right where you're not worried about your food running away from you, and you have to sit in the same place for weeks, if not months, feeding on that material. Okay? And so keep that in mind, because we'll see animals that are what you would call either detritophores or carrion eaters, and a lot of those have very simplified body plans compared to some of their relatives. 
because again, they're just sitting in the same place for months at a time feeding on something, all right? So our next research or race research question, our next framing question deals with nematodes, but we don't have enough time to get through this because this is a description of, 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 I mean, just textbook parasitic groups. Now, not all nematodes are parasites, but most of them are, and they have a body just perfectly built to be a parasite. So we'll pick up here, not on Friday, because on Friday we'll do our exam, but we'll pick up here on Monday. 